All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients! I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen. And today, what we are doing are we are emerging from the Persian Wars into the golden age of classical Greece. So we are gonna see what happens in the aftermath of the wars and how this really serves as a springboard for Greece and especially for Athens to kind of undertake some of the um, most influential cultural developments that we see in the entire ancient Greek world. So let me go ahead and shrink myself a little bit so I get out of the way here. Ah! All right, that should do the trick there. Uh, and let's see what we got on the docket for today. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we are gonna start with a few announcements. Um, we are then going to recap the Persian Wars, right? What caused them, what the major events were, how those played out, and what the aftermath was. And then we're gonna focus on three different things. Uh, we're gonna focus on what's going on outside of mainland Greece, Right, So we're going to actually take a look at what's going on in the Greek world outside of um, uh, kind of where we've been focusing so far. Right, we, we talked early on about colonization. And so we're going to go see what's going on in that part of the Greek world. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move into what those cultural developments actually are and why they were able to take place. And then finally, we may not get to this today, but uh, what we're going to eventually get to is see how some of the kind of awesomeness that we get in classical Greece actually leads to some, some kind of like longer term problems. Uh, and we'll, we'll see why that's the case uh, and then how the Greeks and the Athenians and the Spartans deal with those issues. And uh, what we're going to find, kind of a spoiler alert here, is that Classical Greece only lasts a very short amount of time. This kind of golden age, when we look at the, the time it takes, it's really a narrow kind of time frame compared to everything that we're looking at here. Okay, so let's see what we got in terms of announcements for today. All right, so you guys know the basic ones. Put this thing into speaker view. You can see me, you can see the big old slide, the words, the images, all that great stuff. If you have a message, feel free to go ahead and direct that to your uh, your TA. One of the things I'm going to, to start doing though, I'm not sure if this is the case uh, or not, um, is one of the things that we've got this week is we've got a teaching observation later in the week, all right? And that, there's nothing really special you have to do to prepare for that, right? It's just going to be some people sitting in on the class, seeing how it's going, that sort of thing. But as I've been thinking about that, there are a couple things that I would like to highlight. One of those is interaction. So rather than setting the chat up so you can just chat with the, uh, the, the hosts, right, the TAs uh, and myself, um, I'm going to keep the chat open and public. Uh, keep an eye on whether you're sending messages to the group or just to one of the hosts, right? It's always really embarrassing if you're trying to send a private message, but it accidentally goes to the whole group. <laughs> Make sure if you're sending a message to the whole group, it's something like, oh man, I'm learning so much in this class. This is awesome. And not like, oh, Dr. Rob's the worst. <laughs> I can't wait to get out of here. Um, so just pay attention to that. Uh, the other thing that we'll try to do is in incorporate a little bit in terms of um, some kind of breakout discussions. And I haven't exactly decided how that will work, but we'll play around with it a little bit so that you guys can chat in smaller groups. And then when we get back together as a larger group, we'll share some of those ideas uh, with the, uh, the group as a whole. Um, okay. So, oh, uh, one final thing. The midterm is gonna be a week from Friday, all right? Uh, I will put up a study guide for you later in the week. It's not super helpful. It's just kind of a list of everything that we've covered so far in this class. What I want you guys to do to prepare for that is take all your notes, gather together your stone tablets, whatever you've been writing on, and organize those. Maybe put the stone tablets into a computer so that when you get to the test, 
you have them easily accessible. The test itself is gonna be open note, but you're only gonna have 50 minutes. And what that means is that if your notes are organized and you've been paying attention, you're gonna be able to move pretty quickly through the test. But if you have to kind of go Google around for every answer, it's really gonna take a while and you're gonna be kind of short-ended when you get to the essay question, okay? Um, so you're allowed to use your notes. Uh, you will be doing it on D2L. It's gonna be a week from Friday. You don't need to come to Zoom or anything like that. Nobody's gonna be watching you through your webcam. Um, and it's gonna be some number of multiple choice questions, uh, something like 20 or 30, and, uh, and then one essay question. There will be a review. It will be a week from Wednesday. So the Wednesday before the exam is gonna be a review day. Um, and somebody asked uh, in a private chat here, uh, will the 300 be on the exam? 300 is fair game, right? That's part of, uh, you know, that wasn't like a bonus thing to do. That was kind of in lieu of class on Friday. Um, so that's fair game for the exam. My notes have lots of misspelled names. Misspelled names are totally fine. I, I <laughs> if you are making a like wonderful argument about the progression from like oligarchy to democracy <laughs> and you're misspelling everybody's name, I have no problem at all with that, all right? So we will talk more about this. Um, get it on your radar. For right now, start organizing your notes. Uh, then we'll have a review session next Wednesday. And next Friday, you will have the opportunity to do the actual exam during class time. Does that make sense? Like it'll be during class time, but you don't actually have to show up to Zoom. Like instead of Zoom, you just go to D2L and you click like midterm and it will be available at that time. How long is the essay supposed to be? There's no like set length for this. There's no minimum length, no maximum length. Uh, what I would say is probably like if you have three or four or five sentences, you're probably going to be on the pretty short end there. And if you have a thousand words, you're going to be on the long end. So I know that's a huge range between those. Um, but you're going to want more than a, a couple of sentences. Um, but it doesn't need to be, you know, a textbook or something like that. Okay, so we'll talk more about that as we go on. Let's go ahead. Oh, uh, you won't get the essay question beforehand. Um, hmm, hmm. Let me think about that. That's a good question. Here's maybe what I'll do. How about later this week? I provide a set of like 10 essay questions, okay? And I will choose one of those essay questions for the exam. And what that will mean is if you wanna spend the next week, right, and your weekend like putting together some outlines for all 10, you're gonna do an awesome job on the essay, right? You'll have all the information ready to go. If you put in the work, you will do really well. If you're like, I bet it's gonna be question four, and you write that one out ahead of time, and it is question four, awesome, you've got your essay ready to go. Uh, if you just focus on question four, and it turns out to be question seven, um, maybe not as awesome. <laughs> but how about that, is that, is that fair? Like uh, to give you guys like some larger set of questions and I'll choose one of them? Great, all right, perfect. Okay, I wanna jump into this because we got a lot to cover with classical Greece here. Uh-oh, I missed my cool slide. All right, there we go. Recapping the Persian Wars. This is gonna go very quickly. Don't freak out, it's all good here. All right, so remember, when we looked at Persia leading up to the Persian Wars, we gotta look at this map just to get a sense for scale, right? There's Greece way back there, looking all tiny and piddly. And then we have the mighty Persian Empire. At this time, this is the greatest, largest empire the world has ever seen. Okay, and remember, this arises um, out of these kind of empires in the east starting to bump up against the Greek city-states along the Ionian coast, right, the west coast of modern-day Turkey. And we saw that Croesus was one of the first ones to start levying really heavy taxes. And eventually, a few uh, decades after Croesus, um, the Persians have maintained that position of levying taxes and those Greek city-states revolt. 
And they do a really successful job. They march to the like provincial capital and they burn the thing down. They burn down the city of Sardis. Now, in the short term, that's kind of cool for the Greeks. In the aftermath, Persia is not happy. So they march up and down the Ionian coast, burning all the city-states, all right? And then after they do that, they start looking for the other people who were helping out those city-states. So they start sailing west across the Aegean, burning these little islands and the city-states on the islands as they go. And eventually, they make their way uh, to the coast of mainland Greece, and they start looking for Athens. So they ask Athens to submit, and Athens just chops off the head of the heralds. They ask Sparta to submit, and Sparta says, you want earth and water? Come get it for yourself. And Persia's like, all right, we will do that. Now, the first battle uh, is the Battle of Marathon. And this is the one where our guy Phidippides here, right? He first has to run all the way to Sparta at, for, to ask for help. No help's coming. Then he's got to run all the way to the site of Marathon to ask for help. Or, sorry, not to ask for help, to actually fight in the battle. And the battle pits 30,000 Persians against 9,000 Athenians. And it's this general Miltiades who's leading the Athenians. It's, they almost decide not even to fight, right? It's that scary of a proposition going up against the Persians. It's only a six to five vote that, that kind of determines the fact that they will put up a fight here. But incredibly, right, the Athenian phalanx, that style of warfare, right, where you're marched up with your shields against you and your partner, right, marching forward with your long spears, eventually, right, that is successful. They're able to push back the Persians. And our guy Phidippides then has to run all the way from the site of Marathon back into the city of Athens to go to announce to everybody that the Greeks actually won, right? The Athenians won. And you cannot then betray the city to the Persians and let them in the city walls uh, to try to curry favor and not be killed because you won the battle. So Phidippides delivers that message and then dies because he's run so, so much. Now, the Battle of Marathon occurs in 490, all right? 490 is the date of the Battle of Marathon. And this is hugely important. This is the first time somebody's put up a fight against the Persians and actually won. But keep in mind here that this is small potatoes. 30,000 Persians is like, this is like a tiny little detachment of the larger Persian army, right? This is not the whole thing. This is like one little thing that they sent over. They thought it would be no big deal. Now, 10 years later, that all begins to change as Persia comes by in a much, much larger force. But the Athenians have gotten lucky, all right? And they've gotten lucky because they've hit upon a silver mine, right? They, they're mining in southern Attica. They hit upon this huge load of silver. And it's the general Themistocles who convinces the people not to take the money for themselves. He's like, don't get greedy here. Use this money for the city, right? For the state of the Greeks as a whole. And they build a new navy, 200 new warships, new triremes. And this makes Athens the new naval power in the Mediterranean. Now, when Persia comes marching in, they're bringing their army primarily by land. Herodotus says 5 million. We think maybe more like 500,000. Either way, up in like recorded history, this is the biggest single army we've seen. And nonetheless, the Spartans put up resistance and they do so at the, at the site of Thermopylae, right? And this is the movie that you guys watched last week. And the Persians like can't even believe that the Spartans are going to put up a defense, right? Persia's just been marching in, cities are being burned along the way or just being abandoned to the Persians. But the Spartans put up uh, the, the fight here and the, the shoreline's changed a little bit over time, but what you can see here is it really is a pretty narrow place, right? So the mountains are quite steep. The old shoreline would have been kind of near where the highway is today. And so you really don't have much room there. And day after day after day, where did we go? Day after day after day, the Spartans 
are able to hold off the Persians until eventually the Persians make their way through this kind of pass in the mountains, besiege them on both sides, and the Persians eventually kill the Spartans and win the Battle of Thermopylae. Now, this is really bad for the Athenians, right? Even though the Athenians weren't really contributing there, all the Greeks now have to move backwards to the site of Corinth. That's where they're going to make their stand. And Persia just marches right into Athens and burns the city to the ground. But what happens next is really the turning point, not in the battle, but the turning point in the war. So the Greeks get together and they decide, what are we going to do here? And again, it's um, Themistocles who convinces them, let's go ahead and put up a fight, but not one on land, right? We've been beaten on land decisively at Thermopylae. Thermopylae. Let's put up the fight on water. That's where our strength is. And you can see a good, I mean, like this is just one little part of, of Greece here, but look at it, right? It's all kinds of little peninsulas and islands, right? These are a naval seafaring people, and they are very, very good on the water. Plus, they've got a brand new fleet of 200 new ships. And it's the Battle of Salamis, where the Greeks end up hiding their ships behind one of the peninsulas sticking out from the island of Salamis. They sucker in the Persian fleet, and they're able to destroy them. And this actually happens because they send a fake traitor over to the Persians, um, you know, a real traitor was the one who betrayed them at Thermopylae, but they send a fake one this time and they say the Greeks are almost done. One more victory and they're going to cave. And that's what gets the Persians to actually fight this naval battle. And in doing so, uh, the Greeks just annihilate the Persian fleet that breaks the supply lines. That's really the key there, right? The supply lines are broken and this starts to fragment the Persian army. So it's the Battle of Salamis in 480 that's the turning point in the war, and more than 200 Persian ships are sunk in the battle. Now, the major land battle in Greece happens at the site of Plataea a year later. That's the last one that happens on mainland Greece. And at that same time, across the sea in Ionia, the Greeks win again at the site of Mycale, saying that, or kind of establishing the fact that not only can they win in mainland Greece, they can win in Ionia, where Persia is even stronger as well. So that brings us to an end of the Persian Wars. This is a huge upset in terms of kind of the strengths of the relative strengths of the two armies. And it's that battle, that naval battle at Salamis that really turns the tide. Now, what we're going to do here is we're gonna look at what's going on in other parts of the Mediterranean, right? We've really been focusing right here. This is where everything's been happening. But we've talked about before, when we've been talking about um, kind of archaic Greece and the eighth century Renaissance, we've been talking about the process of colonization, right? So that first colony we looked at was the site of Pithecusae over there. And when we look at the larger map, there are Greek city-states all over the place, right? So again, we've been focusing kind of right here, but we've got Greek city-states all around the Black Sea, on Cyprus, Anatolia, Southern Italy, Sicily, Southern France, Eastern Spain, right? There are Greek city-states all over the place. And what we're gonna do now is kind of see what's going on. In particular, we're gonna focus on this region, the region we call Magna Graecia. And this is the site of Southern Italy, right? You guys should be able to recognize the, the boot here, the bottom of the boot, and then kicking the little football that is Sicily down here, the triangular football. And you can see that all these different things are city-states in this region. And it's so full of Greek city-states that in Latin they call it Magna Graecia, Greater Greece, essentially. So, we're gonna focus in on the island of Sicily in particular because it plays a big role uh, in the stories that's to come. So what we're looking at here, the blue areas are Greek, right? And it's um, the, the kind of major sites that we're dealing with are sites like Syracuse and Gila and Akragas and Salinas and Hemera, right? 
you can see from the remains, these are thriving Greek city-states. I mean, that's a large theater over here, massive temples at Akragas and Salinas, um, big, big sites in Sicily. But this, the, the Greeks aren't the only one on the island. When we look in the north and we look in the west, we also get the Carthaginians. They're in purple over here. And it makes sense to take a few minutes and talk about the Carthaginians, kind of who they are and where they come from and what their deal is, because they're going to play a big role in what's going on in this part of the Greek world. So the Carthaginians are most famous for this guy over here. Anybody know who this guy is? He's not really fighting the Greeks. This is a couple hundred years into the future. It is Hannibal, right? So the Carthaginians are most famous for their general Hannibal uh, and their series of three wars against the Romans. And we'll tell that story. You're going to hear the story of that later in the class. But the Carthaginians are powerful far, far earlier in history uh, before we get to the Punic Wars here. So what they are, they're a, a Phoenician colony, all right? And when we look at that, this is the area of Phoenicia over here in purple modern day kind of Syria and Lebanon and uh, Israel and Palestine, that kind of region. And they're all in purple because purple ends up being actually what their name is. Okay. So when we talk about their wars with Rome, those are called the Punic Wars. And if you've ever wondered why they're the Punic Wars, why aren't they the Phoenician Wars or why aren't they the Carthaginian Wars? It's because Punic is the Latin word for Phoenician, and Phoenician essentially means purple. And we'll see why that is. Now, the Phoenicians are often, or the, the Carthaginians and Phoenicians, get somewhat of a bad reputation in Greece and Rome because they fight against them, right? They're often seen as this kind of other, a barbarian, right? An outsider. And while there was conflict, that's not how we want to think of the Carthaginians and Phoenicians, right? This is, these are very advanced um, people in terms of the, the complexity of their, their social and cultural um, systems and structures and networks. And we saw earlier, right, that when we look at the Greek alphabet, the Greek alphabet that we have is entirely taken from the Phoenicians. So it's kind of cool here, right? You can see the Phoenician version over on the left and just look at how close this is, the Phoenician version, to the early Greek version of the alphabet here, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. So all of these are coming straight from the Phoenician alphabet. Now, we get the word Phoenician from the Greeks, right? The Greeks basically call this the land of purple. That's what Phoenicia, or Phoenicus means. And that purple is, they call that this area, not because the land itself looks purple, but because the Phoenicians, this group of people, was known for their ability to produce a very kind of uh, a deep, vivid purple dye that they would use to dye clothing and textiles with. And you can see some versions of that over here. And that dye actually comes from the Murex snail, right? So you see a little snail shell over here. Um, and it's from that that we get these deep, dark purples that the people become known for. And then that name gets applied by the Greeks to the entire culture. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, they love this purple color, right? So it becomes used as uh, a symbol for royalty throughout the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. And you can see that in some of the, uh, the, the ancient frescoes over here. When a Roman had a triumphal procession, that was the time when they were allowed to wear this royal purple, right? They weren't really allowed to wear that normally because they didn't want any kings in Rome. But during the triumph, you got to wear purple. Later on, even in, like, we're talking a thousand years later, uh, and I think this is a mosaic of Justinian in the Byzantine period, still wearing this Tyrian purple, this Phoenician purple, to signify uh, royalty. So the Phoenicians are really making a, um, a, a 
lot of money, right? A lot of financial gain from selling their kind of dyed textiles to the rest of the Mediterranean. And they're becoming wealthy enough. And this region's becoming popular, like kind of um, population heavy enough that just like the Greeks, they set out to colonize. And somewhere in the ninth century, the 800s BC, they found the city of Carthage. Now Carthage becomes the greatest of the Greek colonies. And we can see a reconstruction here uh, of what the, the port would have looked like. The port itself was very famous in terms of being this giant circular thing where you would sail ships into, into the center here. And then there are lots of little kind of docks around the side where the ship would go in, it gets lifted out of the water, then you can work on it and patch the ship up. And what's super cool here is we can still see, right? We don't have any of the superstructure, but we can still see exactly where this was in the, the kind of landscape in modern day Tunisia. This is where uh, the, the harbor would have been, the central structure in the middle, and then the ships would have been right along the side here. And if you take a closer look underwater, you can actually still see the different bays the, the ships would have had to move into. So the Carthaginians, just like the Phoenicians from the Levant, become these seafaring traders. And again, when we, when we kind of get the story from the Greeks and the Romans, oh, they're seen as these evil people, right? But when we look at what they're doing culturally, man, this is awfully close to what's going on in the Greek world, right? So they're colonizing, they're developing fairly sophisticated trade products. They are sending those products all over the Mediterranean. Politically, they're being ruled in the same way that the Greeks were being ruled, right? During the archaic period, they have these oligarchies that rule. They have a Senate or a Gerousia, just the same way that the Spartans have. They have an assembly that votes on things. So very, very similar, even though the Greeks and the Romans kind of picture them as these, um, yeah, these barbarians from North Africa. Now, one of the things that the Greeks and the Romans consistently focus on is this practice that they have of child sacrifice. And it's brought up that in times of chaos or in times of war or in times of drought or in times of famine, that the Carthaginians would take a young baby, right, and sacrifice them to the gods as a way to appease the gods and uh, gain favor and get rid of whatever the, the current kind of conflict or problem is. And what's crazy is we've actually got archeological evidence for this as well. So at the site of Carthage and at the site of Matsya, which we'll see later today, um, we've actually found these things. They're called the tofet. That's the term that's used for these children's cemeteries. Uh, so kind of, even though they, they mirror the Greeks and Romans in some sense, uh, they still see this one practice as, as very outside of Greco-Roman norms. Okay, so what we want to do now is, uh, is look at what's going on in the island, on the island of Sicily with the, the Greeks. And one of the things that we see is that in Greece, individuals are becoming more and more powerful. Okay, so remember, when we looked at the Greek mainland, we saw the opposite prop, uh, process happening, right? Their power is going out to more and more people. In Sicily, individuals are getting more and more powerful. And the reason that's occurring is because Sicily is getting filthy, stinking rich because of what you see right here, right? They are able to farm grain better than anywhere in mainland Greece. So what I encourage you guys to do is, you know, once COVID's over, go to Sicily, wander around the landscape, then hop over to Greece, and wander around the landscape, and you will see for yourself how much more conducive Sicily is to growing grain. And grain is super important because this is like the staple of what you eat uh, in the, the ancient uh, Greek world. So the city-states in Sicily are getting wealthy from growing grain and then exporting it across the Mediterranean back to mainland Greece. And we can kind of see that here. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side, um, this is the site of Segesta uh, in Sicily. Um, 
fabulously spectacular sight. You can kind of see uh, it has rolling hills, but these things are mild enough where you can have huge kind of plots of grain. On the right hand side, we have the site of Delphi in mainland Greece. And here it's just, I mean, it, Greece is really a mountainous place. And that's good for olives. You can grow olives on mountainsides. In some places you can grow grapes on mountainsides, but it's really difficult to grow grain in those areas. Okay, uh, one of the other things that we're getting, um, we're getting different kind of groups of Greeks in different areas. And what we're gonna see is that that plays a role in the different alliances that end up forming. So one of those alliances, uh, again, we've got the area of the Greeks in blue here, um, is from, and then we've got the area of the, uh, the Carthaginians in purple. And what we've got is we've got two different tyrants. My head's in the way here, but we've got this guy, Gilon of Syracuse, and he's gonna team up with this guy, Theron of Akragas. And what they're gonna go do is they are gonna both head to the site of Hemera up in Northern Sicily to put up a fight against the Carthaginians, all right? So first of all, they kick out the, uh, the tyrant here in Hemera. They both take over and that's what causes the Carthaginians to, to have this kind of conflict up here. Okay, so it was said that on the very same day as the Battle of Salamis, most scholars don't think this is actually the case, but the Greek historians write it up as though it happened on the exact same day. But on the exact same day as the Battle of Salamis, where the Greeks beat the Persians, the Sicilian Greeks are going up against the Carthaginians. And this is gonna be a very tough battle. Carthage actually has a bigger land army at the time, uh, and they are going to uh, leverage that against the Greeks. And what Carthage does is they send to an ally, right? They're, we, let's go back to the kind of map here. So the Carthaginians are based in Panormus up here. This becomes modern day Palermo. And they send down here, and they're asking for um, cavalry reinforcements from the site of Silenus. And the, the site of Silenus, it's Greek, but it's not the same type of Greek as these guys, right? Doric versus Ionian, different alliances there. And so they're asking for, for cavalry reinforcements. But what ends up happening in this battle is that Theron and Gilon, their forces over here at Hemera, intercept the messenger on their way to Silenus, the guy asking for the, the cavalry. He in, he's intercepted. And what happens is that they then dress up their own cavalry, like cavalry from the site of Silenus. They march them straight into the Persian, or not the Persian, the, uh, the Carthaginian camps, acting like they're the reinforcements that the Carthaginians asked for. And then they just slaughter everybody. And it's an incredibly bloody affair. But the Greeks, no mercy anywhere. They just take out the Carthaginians. And on the exact same day that it's said that they beat the Persians over in the, the kind of Greek mainland, um, they, uh, they beat the Carthaginians over on, uh, on the island of Sicily. Okay, so let's go ahead and take care of uh, attendance for today. Go ahead, it's uh, attendance quiz 15, February 22nd. Go ahead and put in white and uh, then we will see what's going on back in mainland Greece. Uh-oh, is it not white today? Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I guess that just means that everybody will get credit. I'll go ahead and, and uh, after class today, I'll go ahead and, and put in attendance for today. I don't know, I must have clicked on the wrong one or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> don't, don't have a heart attack. That's, that's an overreaction, right? I will go ahead and uh, make sure that everybody gets their attendance credit for today. Don't you worry. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Sorry if uh, anybody incurred um, heart attacks as a result. Okay, let's go ahead. I probably did put it for Friday's quiz. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and look at what's going on in mainland Greece and get Heracles out of here. Nice job, Heracles. You really botched that one. <laughs> uh, we call this the Golden Age uh, in Greece uh, and especially in Athens. And if there's one kind of person that you focus on in the aftermath of the Persian Wars, after Greece has beaten the Persians. Go ahead and keep this guy in mind. His name's Pericles, and he becomes kind of the leader of Athens during the middle of the 5th century, the middle of the 400s BC, all right? And he's a political leader, and he's a military leader, and he's a cultural leader, right? He's a huge patron of the arts. He's friends with all the philosophers. And he gets to be such a big deal that they, the kind of historian, historians call him the, the first citizen of Athens, right? They're all citizens and they're all equal, but he's the first citizen, maybe the, the most important. Okay, so one of the things that occurs during the, the kind of leadership of Pericles is the formation and expansion of what we call the Delian League. And we call it the Delian League because it's centered on the island of Delos, which is down here in the Cyclades, all right? And Delos becomes the treasury. That's where they keep all the money for the, uh, the Delian League. Now, Athens is at the head of the Delian League, and the reason that all these city-states in, in purple have teamed up here in the Delian League is basically to prevent any further Persian invasions, right? We just went through this huge thing. Um, and uh, what ends up happening then is that Athens gets these city-states together and basically ends up saying, um, okay, let's team up, we'll prevent any further invasions, and uh, what we'll end up doing then is kind of everybody either contributes some ships to the Navy to prevent the, uh, the per Persian invasions, or if you don't have ships, just uh, contribute some money instead. And that's logical, right? That like you, you, everybody chips in to, to put up this defense against any further Persian invasions. They keep the money on Delos. But Athens as kind of the preeminent naval power and the strongest of the city-states in the Delian League, well, they, they start to like make use of the money that's flowing in to the Delian League. And they start to do some really cool things with it, right? So like, I don't know where I found this, this thing on um, online, but I found some, some awesome image of the Parthenon decked out in all the money that they got from the Delian League. But uh, Athens is getting fabulously wealthy as a result of, uh, of managing this league. This is the closest Athens ever gets to really being an empire. They call it a league, they call it a coalition of city-states. Athens is no doubt at the head of this thing and they're using a lot of the money for their own personal gain. So, Pericles, right, is the one running this thing. He's making Athens fabulously wealthy, uh, but he's not just kind of doing it for his own personal gain, or at least, He's not doing that outwardly. He's really funneling a lot of it into the city-state and promoting this idea of democracy uh, and investing in arts and culture. So like I was saying, he's friends with all these philosophers. This fifth century is when we get Socrates, right? Perhaps the most famous of the Greek philosophers. And then his student, Plato, who ends up actually doing all the writing. This is the reason we know about Socrates. Socrates didn't actually write anything down, so we don't really have a super clear sense for what he thought or argued or believed, but we get the writings of Plato who talks about Socrates, and that's our kind of closest guess, right? And Socrates was known uh, for asking people questions. And this is one of the big things, right? Remember when we talked about philosophy earlier? 
the big change was trying to explain why things happen and come up with explanations that don't involve the gods. But in classical Greece, the questions changed again. And this time, the questions changed not just like why things happen, but it's now focused on people. And the question now is like, how should people behave? What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be beautiful, right? These kind of really deep philosophical questions that go beyond just the way the natural world works. And so Socrates, he deals with these through asking questions and having dialogues. Now, Plato's take on it, the middle guy over here, right? Plato's take on it uh, is that there's some set of perfect forms in the world, right? And we'll never approach those. These are on a higher plane. But when we see beautiful things in the world, or we see people acting right, they're approaching this kind of higher plane of beautiful forms, even though we won't actually end up getting there. And then uh, Plato's student Aristotle, he goes on uh, to integrate these kind of philosophical questions with another approach to the natural world. He ends up being the tutor for Alexander the Great and this idea of philosophy that started with Socrates and then went to Plato and then went to Aristotle now spreads throughout the Greek world. So philosophy is something that really takes off and in a new direction, asking what it means to be good and to act right, be a good person in the world, right? Really a different change from, from kind of the why, do, why does the natural world operate the way that it does. Sculpture changes as well, right? So what we're looking at here, this probably hopefully looks familiar. This is archaic Greek sculpture, right? Kind of idealized, uh, a little bit abstract, becoming a little bit more lifelike. Um, we got the little archaic smile here. And what we see during the classical period is we see movement occur, right? All of a sudden, things become a little bit less idealized. Well, that's still pretty idealized, but a little bit less uh, rigid, much more movement, much more fluid, much more lifelike, people engaged doing actual things. So sculpture is evolving and Pericles is supporting the arts. And one of the best examples of this kind of classical sculpture actually comes from the Parthenon itself. So what you're looking at here is uh, some of the most famous sculptures here that are taken from the frieze on the Parthenon. And I'll point out where that is in just a second. And it's a scene from what's known as the Panathenaic Festival, all right? And so we've got these equestrian horsemen over here. Um, and what ends up uh, happening is in the later aftermath, these are actually taken down off the Parthenon and, and moved over to Britain. But that's a, maybe we'll start with that story next time. Now, Greek architecture is also exploding during the classical period. Now, remember, the Acropolis got burned. So, moving into the aftermath of the victory, the Acropolis is kind of a blank slate, right? And what that ends up um, meaning here is that Athens now has a chance to rebuild. They're getting all kinds of money from the Delian League. They've got a blank slate in the center of the city, up on this giant rocky outcropping, and they've got the opportunity to do something really special. And Pericles takes the lead in terms of organizing this building program. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the Acropolis here. And you can notice, I mean, if you go to Athens, this is, it juts out of the heart of the city. It's all, one of the coolest things in Athens is get a hotel with like a rooftop, rooftop like bar or even like a rooftop pool is super cool because almost any rooftop in Athens can see the Acropolis. It juts out that much. Uh, and what Pericles does is he organizes in a completely new building program on the Acropolis dedicated to the goddess Athena. Okay, so what we're looking at here uh, is a plan of the Acropolis. And we're gonna focus on four buildings today, right? We'll wrap it up with a focus on these four buildings. Now, there are a lot more than four here, but there are four that date to this period uh, where Pericles was kind of 
organizing things. Some of the other ones are older, some of the other ones are later. And where we're gonna begin is over here on the, uh, the west side of things with the Propylaea, all right? And this is the entranceway to the Acropolis. So here we are looking at it, all right? And what Pericles builds is this, this kind of monumental entranceway worthy of like entering this sacred space. And what we've got here, right? Remember Thermopylae, the hot gates? So that root word right in here, right? Pila means gates, right? And pro means in front of, right? Or front. So we've got very literally the front gate to the Acropolis. And this would be the place where you would go after making your way, there's something known as the Panathenaic Way that's associated with a very famous festival in Athens that goes, winds through the city, winds through the Agora, ends up leading to the, uh, the monumental entranceway. Okay, so the Propylaea is the first thing that, that uh, we've got here, the, ma the major entranceway. Now I want you to focus on this tiny little building right here, all right? We can go back, it's this tiny little thing. You see it kind of right next to the front gate. This is the temple of Athena Nike, all right? Now one of the things that happens in the ancient Greek world, uh, and you'll get a sense for this if you take a mythology class, is that all the gods and goddesses have different forms, right? So Athena has lots of different things. You have Athena Promachos, Athena like the in front of the battle. You've got Athena Parthenos, Athena the Virgin. You've got Athena Nike, Athena the goddess of victory. Athena Polias, Athena the goddess of the city, right? Many different versions. This tiny little temple here is dedicated to Athena Nike, Athena the goddess of victory. And you can see it's a great example. Hopefully you guys can recognize those little scrolls there. Remember the volutes? Uh, uh, of Ionic architecture um, in this little thing overlooking the city of Athens. Then we've got the big mama here, all right? So the biggest of the structures on the Acropolis, this is what's known as the Parthenon, right? And we call it the Parthenon because it's dedicated to Athena Parthenos, right? Athena the maiden or Athena the virgin. And this is the biggest temple in all of Greece for a very, very long time. And it's from just inside here. It's not the outside right here, just inside there, there would have been another realm of sculpture that tells the story of that Panathenaic festival um, going all around the temple. And that's where those horsemen came from earlier. And then finally, what we've got is we've got the Erechtheon. Right? And it's this super, like, look at the, this is what a normal Greek temple looks like. Look at how weird this temple looks. And when we look at it, uh, you can see that it's kind of got a very weird shape. It's got these caryatids, right? Those are the, the, the women. They're like, you got columns that are carved into the shape of women. Um, and this is where the contest for Athens would have taken place. So we will uh, talk maybe a little, Let's start with the story of the contest for Athens next time. That will be a, uh, a good place to start, all right? And uh, what we'll do then um, is, yeah, focus on the story behind the Erechtheion and conclude uh, our story of the Athenian Acropolis. So again, to close today, what we've got is we've got a brand new building program. You can see the aerial photo here. Uh, on the Athenian Acropolis, Athens is getting fabulously wealthy in the aftermath of the Persian Wars because they're at the head of the Delian League. And what we'll see on Wednesday is it's just a flash in the pan. It's awesome. The things being produced are incredible. But very, very shortly, these tensions rise and Greece goes to war. But this time, it goes to war with itself. So, all right, guys, have a wonderful, wonderful couple days. I will see you back here on Wednesday uh, and uh, have a great day until then. All right, all right bye, everyone.